So uh, I welcome everybody to this session when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And I can see that uh, there are only a handful of toughest guys and girls who are present here in this session. And so this session is uh, a very interactive kind of video based session and we have been doing it for uh, many years now. So the format is that presenter is going to show a tough situation in the cataract surgery and discussant, they can stop presenter anytime. They feel like uh, at any step of the surgery and they can discuss that what different could have been done in that situation. So the idea is that it remains interactive, even audience can participate at the end of the uh, this presentation. So that we come out with some teaching points, some new ways of, you know, how that particular situation can be handled in different ways. Because there are many ways to skin the cat. Everybody has their own way of doing it. So we should learn from each other. So I'd like to invite the first presenter, uh, that is Dr. Vanashi Nair. And she is cataract and refractive surgeon at Gerzara Institute, Cochin and uh, a prolific uh, surgeon. Uh, thank you so much Vanashi for uh, joining for this session and I'll request uh, Sheetal also to please come on the stage so that Rishi and Sheetal and we all can discuss the case. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this wonderful session. Uh, today I'm uh, presenting a case uh, which is a case of a pseudo exfoliation. Uh, let me start my video. A case of pseudo exfoliation and small pupil and suspected weak zonules. The video is not playing over there. see the video here. Okay. Okay. Can I just play it again? One second. Can you just help me with that? Because it has gone ahead. On the top. Just. It's not showing on my screen. I cannot control it. case of pseudo exfoliation small pupil and weak zonules because uh, i knew that the lens and ir lens iris diaphragm had moved ahead compared to the other eye so i had explained the patient and when i started the case i was prepared to uh, handle if there were weak zonules or the bag was going to be weak so i first went in stained the capsule and i realized that the pupil was not uh, uh, improving in its size it was not dilating more so i decided to use the maligan ring to give me more of pupil dilatation and uh, then look ahead as to how I can go. So this is the Maligan ring, which is a pupil expansion device, a very helpful device that we can use to stabilize the iris. Because in these cases, as we know, even the iris can become floppy and uh, lead to further problems, or the pupil may come down more during the case. So after engaging all the scrolls of the Maligan ring, with the help of two Krugelans hook. I s began my capsular axis uh, with the cystitome, but as you can see, th the moment I'm trying to puncture the capsule, it is just not yielding. I'm not able to get a point of uh, beginning of the flap of the capsular axis. The whole bag just kept on moving. That's the point, uh, that's the uh, time I realized that the viscoelastic was less, so I refilled the anterior chamber with viscoelastic and again tried my luck. And uh, I was successful in initiating the capsular axis here. And uh, slowly I tried to initiate my flap 
in an anti-clockwise fashion. Me being a left-handed surgeon, I prefer the anti-clockwise method of capsular excess. At this point, I felt that uh, the zonules were getting pulled. So I decided uh, it will be safer to go with the capsular excess forcep. Slowly, each clock, I was trying to uh, go ahead and here I realized that the, again the bag is getting pulled downwards. So I thought, let me go with another capsular excess forcep. Uh, Stabilize. Manashi, can you pause the? Are you not able pause. to pause it? Can you please help me with this? Pause the video, please. Uh, yeah. I'm not able to control it from my laptop, actually. You can do it again. So at this point, I'd like to ask uh, Rishi here that what are the clues like which you get when you are doing rexes that yes, this bag is so unstable and what is your thought process that yes, what's come, what can come up next and how do you plan, you know? You just stop it and play it again. So in uh, this particular case, the clue is right there actually. The fact that you're not able to puncture yeah. means that the zonules are lax. There is something going on because your bag should be stretched out and the fact that it is going down with the needle means that the zonules are lax and you can see as she's also moving the capsule uh, for the rexus yeah. the whole thing is moving so much so uh, obviously you're dealing with a case of uh, compromised zonules in this particular case yeah right and so uh, do you uh, like plan to put a CTR early at this stage or like what decides that so what you once I know that the zonules are weak, I would go ahead and put it straight away, right after the rexis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even for the rexis, if I'm not getting the counter traction, I would have used a Kuglin hook or something uh, after initiating the rexis to give some counter pressure to make it easier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thoughts? Yeah, yes. Rohit, sir? Yeah, please go ahead. I uh, know. I was just saying yeah. that uh, in this uh, case, I defer. Like, if I am in uh, this place, I would not like to put the CTR immediately because it's first of all a little difficult to put with the cataract, so much of cataract in. So what I would do is just put the capsular hooks and uh, to give the support to the bag, uh, finish off with my phaco emulsification and then put the CTR. I think I fully agree with her because uh, uh, capsular hooks, uh, one should, uh, that should be the first line of action because with the capsular hooks what you are trying to do is you are trying to create anterior posterior uh, support. Thank you. You are yeah. immobilizing the bag. So you are giving, we, at this stage, we need more of an anterior posterior support. Yes. Horizontal support is required if by any means you find that the nucleus is soft. Because when you will do the emulsification, then in the intra, inter, uh, you know, hooks part, the bag can be aspirated. So that can be delayed as she has already said. Uh, additionally, what I feel is that since, you know, the best thing which you did was, I really like the way you use the second forceps. Yeah. So that's an excellent maneuver. But that may not be possible for uh, some of us. So for that, you know, once you uh, make a rexis, may maybe two clock hours, then one clock hour behind you can put one capsular hook. Yeah. So you can go on adding that so that by the time your rexis is complete, your rexis is complete with partial support and that will go on filling it. So, you know, you can do it along with. Yes. Any yeah. thoughts, Dr. Harshu? And, and always try to, and always use micro capsule excess forces yeah, because the she cystitome, yeah, cystitome won't help. Absolutely. And as Dr. Rohit said, of course, once you put those hooks, basically they take off all the forces, you know and anchor it in anteroposterior, it gives us support. It. Yes. Very gives nice. Let's move ahead, I think. So that's what uh, uh, I thought, that let me stabilize the capsular bag, because during the rexis, I felt that the whole bag was moving. I didn't want the bag out right when I began the phaco emulsification. So I decided to go with four capsular hooks and uh, place them. Uh, and then I started with my phaco emulsification. Now, this was a softer cataract and I didn't want to, uh, you know, after uh, hydro dissection, I didn't want to uh, rotate the nucleus. So I started right in the beginning and uh, what happened was uh, it, it was a little difficult to crack it. And I landed, uh, th at this point, I thought that let me go in with the CTR and stabilize the bag horizontally and then go ahead with the phaco emulsification because I knew I'm going to struggle with the nucleus management probably because being a softer cataract, I'm not getting two, uh, two halves or uh, multiple cracks. So I f first went and uh, inserted the CTR. 
you had to be careful because my capsular hook was probably going to get entangled but uh, luckily th there was no complication there can you just pause the uh, video here uh, if you are able to so what is the uh, preferred method of putting the ctr dr rohit injector or you just use uh, a free hand method or does it make any difference or yeah i think we have to realize when we are using an injector that puts less stress to the zonules but then uh, uh, i prefer somehow to use uh, you know the manual method free hand yeah but the injector system if you can use uh, is a much better i think you use injectors if i'm not wrong dr harshal uh, no uh, more of a free hand only yeah, i also yeah. use yeah so uh, injector uh, madhu instrument they give injector with that that's good and if you have morcher that's yeah, wonderful that's that system is very good but that's very expensive yeah, yeah <laughs> so free hand works well yeah. and any tips for uh, inserting the ctr sheetal so uh, what i uh, do usually is start from the main wound because for me ergonomically that becomes better and uh, i make sure by once i go inside i just try to tilt it to make sure that i am in the bag and not in the sulcus and one and for the uh, yeah. distal end what i do is before i go into it i take my second instrument in the hand so yes. with the i well dialer i try to give the support yes. and with the sinski hook i put my <coughs> sinski hook into the hole and then put it down and then release yes. it yeah actually a kuglin hook uh, works even better because then it won't slip at all kabhi kabhi yeah. you can slip yes so direct direction of insertion is also very important mm. how very how you have to uh, insert the ctr if the uh, dehiscence caps uh, the back the, the zonular dehiscence is less than 90 degrees then it can be any way yes but if it is more you have to go through area which has the maximum zonular support and then move on you know yes. so it can be clockwise anti clockwise depending True. upon you know yeah, that's a location very of good the tip because yeah. if you start yes. from the dehiscent uh, area yeah. you will never go uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, so ahead you can do it only if it is less than 90 yes absolutely degree right. but if it is more as she said you yeah. know you yes sir so moving ahead <coughs> so managed to uh, remove part of the get a edge up actually and then i ate up the cataract which is uh, relatively softer and uh, you're again the it, it formed a bowl kind of a thing so and i i was a little afraid that if i use more power or vacuum i may disturb the capsular bag nevertheless the ctr was in place so it was a little safer but still i was afraid that uh, after uh, being so careful i shouldn't uh, disturb the pc or you know have a rent over there so it's being a little uh, more can we just stop uh, yeah so did you change any parameters at this point in time uh, with your phaco emulsification no it was a soft cataract so the parameters were for a grade 1 so nucleus so what would you uh, keep your irrigation height and uh, like just for uh, yeah so your aspiration flow rate and uh, yeah everything. so th the thing was uh, there were weak zonules and uh, i was afraid that too much of uh, bottle height would cause problem so i had kept the bottle height around 75 for this case and aspiration flow rate was around 25 probably Yeah, so that's actually again very important uh, to keep the bottle height low. Even I would go actually aspiration flow rate as low as I can keep it, maybe even eighteen or something, whatever your machine allows, because that would cause less turbulence in your anterior chamber. Or you can put an IUL scaffold also for that matter. Yes. You just right. uh, you know if for the last piece, if you are not confident about mm. the uh, bag uh, fluctuation. Fluctuating. you can also always put an iul scaffold yeah and y you need to supplement it with ovd you know again, yeah, again. so that, that yeah, yeah absolutely when it yeah so 100% that is so and uh, it yeah. the bag will not come towards yeah. your uh, so fake probe so whenever there is a last piece remaining and i'm not confident that's what i do i just stop go fill in with and, the ovd and, and other other uh, i think very important thing is many a times if you just take off your you know last piece is there you take out the your chopper or whatever instrument from side port yeah. because that causes another you know extra leakage yeah. so you just have your hand piece there in it you don't have anything from side port so that also gives better stability to anterior chamber right. yeah so slowly and uh, carefully i took off that piece and uh, for irrigation aspiration i knew that this is going to be a little bit of a challenge because the ctr is already in place and uh, what i realized is uh, it was a sticky kind of a cortex so there was a little bit of a struggle but uh, i thought let me go slowly and try and uh, 
use a tangential method to pull off the fibers and uh, so at this stage would you like to take off your capsular hooks before doing ia because ctr is already there it's giving good equatorial stretch your bag is like you, you what's your idea you can if you want to uh, i think uh, so because nowadays uh, uh, you know the hooks which are coming uh, the latest ones they have the the chang ones yeah so they have a wider this thing so the C so your idea is ki should we take it out yes you can take them out also at this stage definitely it, i think it depends on the amount of laxity also if you feel that yes they are required or I maybe i actually prefer to keep it in so it hmm. still stretches yeah. your bag and uh, makes it yeah. really easier for the irrigation operation right. right so that we are not pulling on the anterior uh, capsular edge by mistake so then i got the capsular hooks out and uh, had planned a three piece iol for this patient so actually these uh, if you have to uh, use you should use these capsular hooks rather than iris hooks you know so because they are meant for this purpose to uh, iris hooks may damage the anterior capsule margin sometimes yes. yeah yes so if you don't have availability you can use iris hooks yeah. but you should try to use capsular hooks only so i had a little bit of struggle there with the yeah. haptic but then i finally managed to dial it in well into the bag also i think the uh, capsular hooks they tend the rexis up compared to the iris hooks which yes. kind of just stretch it and uh, yes yeah. then finally got the ring out and uh, that was the end of the case okay okay uh thank you very much dr vanashi any uh, further questions from audience if anybody would like to ask any questions to the presenter or want to add anything you know that what could have been done differently so what is the uh, like do you uh, plan to put ctr in every case of pseudo exfoliation or how do you decide uh, shital uh, no i don't put it in every case uh, uh, you mean to say uh, at the i will i have started doing that yes no no, no ctr ctr in every case of pseudo ex no i do not put it every case of pseudo exfoliation if i feel that the zonules are really weak then only i will put it otherwise uh, no because many times what happens is uh, pseudo exfoliation whatever you do 10 years uh, down the line it may yeah. just go down with your ctr as well yes. but yeah because there there are controversial uh, yeah. uh, studies some say it helps but yes. in my practice i usually when i see there is some bit of zonular weakness i definitely go in for ctr yeah. anterior capsular polishing is another thing which should be done in sort of exfoliation patients because in pseudo exfoliation patients there are we have to realize that there are two things which are creating centrifugal force one is the zonular second is the uh, haptic of the iul hmm. the centripetal force is by the capsular excess margin which get fibrous so if you do anterior capsular po polishing hmm. that the centripetal force gets decreased and you can delay the fragmentation which can occur eventually my um, take is this that if your rexis is large enough That's you really don't need to put a ctr if your bag itself is not floppy Absolutely. on surgery mm -hmm. right but if you are not satisfied with the size of your rexis you must put a ctr or enlarge your rexis 100% so so agree yeah, yeah. I, I, so i was also coming to that that yeah. the sizing of the capsular rexis has to be good absolutely so if it's small go ahead and do secondary enlargement before you close up the case don't leave it there because yeah. phimosis and will decenter and do you know all the bad things very early also as compared to normal so it's a progressive disease zonlo is a progressive zonlopathy so it's going to increase with the time also i have uh, i beg to differ with sir on one point of capsular polishing no, there have been some capsule. yeah there have been some studies which show that yeah. uh, capsular polishing increases the fibrosis so i I, I tend to avoid capsular polishing for that I'm reason not seen yes that. maybe yeah maybe yes. i missed out but what could 
Please take the mic. Epithelial cells prevent fibrosis. To prevent uh, capsular fibrosis, how about uh, taking small radial cuts and uh, enlarging the rexis? Absolutely. After oh, putting like the IOL. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's what I said. Do go ahead and do secondary enlargement once you put the IOL and you feel that. So that is the advantage and one should always use pupillary expanded devices like she used, you know, Maligant ring. Because that only gives you the, the proper visibility and you can access the size of the rexis nicely. So if you do a case through 3.5, 4mm pupil, you can't really, you know, assess it properly. Of course, you can use Kugland hook to stretch the iris and see all the sides and you can do all those maneuvers also. But when you have availability of pupillary expanded devices, one should use it as, see. No, one thing you are saying is enlargement of the rexis. What I'm saying is, uh, also yeah. so radial cut with the CTR okay. in yeah. situ in the bag. It's yeah. not a good idea because sometimes the radial cut extends. Yes, your CTR mm -hmm. will pop out of the bag. Then it will not support you can, yeah. you can the do equator. It secondarily also. Yes, you can do it second on YAG. Uh -huh. Yeah. In my needed. practice, what I do is, if uh, what you have said is absolutely fine, the basic concept is there. So that is at times the treatment for con capsular contraction syndrome. That with the YAG also. If you find yeah. you're following up the patient, if you're finding that the rim is getting this fibrosis yeah. and the centripetal force is increasing, you can give radial cuts. Yes. One yeah. thing, instead of multi-piece lens placing in the bag, if I put in the salkas and optic capture, capture. that will work better, I think. Perfect, so perfect. Yeah, that's another school of thought and that yeah. is absolutely right. Because uh, with that small rex is placing the multi-piece lens in the bag, Sometimes it's also creates it stress on the journey. Yeah, absolutely. See, I think then it also depends on the severity of the zonulopathy. No, because it's a mild pseudo explosion. We have been putting in single piece, multi piece, and capsule bag only. Optic capture also prevents capsular fibrosis. Fibrosis also. Mm. Yes. In pseudo explosion cases, capsular fibrosis is uh, very much. It's a long term follow up. Yeah. In um, retinitis pigmentosa and myopic cases, this can yeah, happen. Yeah. I think this very is a, good point. This is, yeah. a very, this is a thought yeah. process which is evolving in a very uh, at a very strong pace. You know, people are putting a multi-piece in the sulcus, capturing it. Capturing right. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vanashi, Thank for you that so wonderful much. case. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Sheetal Mahokar. I request Dr. Vanashi to please come on the stage. Yeah. I'll. The next speaker is Dr. Sheetal Mahokar. And she is a prolific cataract and corneal surgeon from uh, Ratna Foundation, Ahmedabad. Dr. Sheetal, with her case. A very good afternoon to everyone, and thank you, Dr. Harshul, for including me in this wonderful uh, session since some time now. I thoroughly enjoy. So this was my case, which was undergone uh, past plana vitrectomy. Uh, silicone oil was out. As you have seen, I have removed it, stained the capsule, released the posterior sinicae, and I start with my uh, rexis. When I start doing the rexis, I realized that the zonules are very weak. The capsule is fibrous, and I was very, it was very, very difficult for me to move ahead with the uh, rexis. I was trying it from whatever uh, flaps I was getting it and trying to do it. At some point in time, I get a decent amount of flap and uh, with a lot of resistance. Uh, I continue with my rexis, uh, but there was still a lot of resistance uh, when I was doing it. And I finish a very small opening in the anterior capsule. That is what I thought. But to my surprise, what happened is when I proceeded with the hydrodissection, my hydrodissection cannula was not going ahead. And I realized that I have just removed one layer of the anterior capsule and the capsule is actually sitting over there. Yes. So again, I go back with my uh, thing and I try to poke it and it's just my bag is moving and nothing else is happening. I change my 26 gauge needle still I thought sharper would help nothing happens I go with the scissors to make some kind of Can an you opening pause for a moment sure Sheetal I, I think this is not a capsule but it's a subcapsular plaque that you're dealing with right now uh, could be yes yeah it's, it's yeah. quite possible uh, that uh, yeah. I removed the capsule and yes, there is a subcapsular plaque. that is very plug. obviously the capsule and this is a subcapsular plaque. Yeah, but it I was uh, very thin also. So I don't know whether that was the complete capsule or uh, I, I have no idea actually about it. It's yeah, it's a calcified plaque. But that is never in the center. Calcified subcapsular plaque. This is more like a fibrosis. I, I think that was if, if, if I, I think that was a true exfoliation, if you ask me. True capsular exfoliation that was taken out in the first go. 
the second go is what she yeah it was too thin actually yeah. to have uh, to call it as a complete capsule so even i thought maybe uh, i mean like i would agree with dr rohit uh, okay. uh, so uh, as i was saying that i was trying all the maneuvers with the scissors and mvr blade to make some kind of an opening and uh, i was just going coming out with one this thing and trying again with the same forceps again and again uh, and to be very frank at that point this is an edited thing but i was very very tired and i was not understanding what to do at some point in time i get the uh, opening i remove little bit of fluid and start my rexes start doing it with the forceps and i realize that it's not moving at all with the forceps also so i decide to go ahead with the scissor i cut bit continue with the uh, pulling it with the forceps and uh, again it was not happening so i realized that okay i just have to use my scissors and cut it whatever that fibrous part is and i make a very small opening in the capsule and start with the thing i debulk it with the irrigation aspiration uh, uh this thing i keep on debulking actually whatever cortical matter is there so i did not want too much of pressure inside and kept on using my scissor and cutting it and making it uh, making some opening uh can i just interrupt you here this is definitely a subcapsular yeah. fibrosis what you could have done here was actually try and dissect that whole uh, plaque from the capsule off so you can actually put a spatula and kind of just do a lamellar dissection and okay. separate the whole thing then this thing can be actually peeled entirely No, then, I, uh, so where do we put the spatula? Is wherever that? you find an opening, oh. introduce it, and then you start dissecting, okay. like you do a lamellar dissection in a cornea, and the whole plaque can I, be separated I, often. I think I was wrong. You're, yes. you're absolutely yeah. right. I had never seen a central yeah. calcified subcapsular plaque. I don't think this is calcified. It's more of fibrosis, yeah. fibrosis uh, yeah. which can happen in these kind of vitrectomized eyes. Yeah. So uh, also, if you were struggling and it wasn't happening, then the next thing to do would have been to use a vitrector that would have made your life a lot I easier i actually yeah. thought but i wasn't very sure whether uh, whether i would uh, that would help me or would cause more problems uh, for me but that thought had gone in my mind when i was doing so, it to uh, do it i I, I use the uh, radio frequency capsulotomy probe you know which is there in my artley machine okay it just you know melt the capsule yeah, yeah. the subcapsular plaques yeah 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 so where wherever you have very fibrotic capsules also many times which are not able to puncture or which are not able to cut through it does that okay. that's a wonderful tool which yeah. we have that's what they call yeah that's a rf capsulotomy probe yeah yeah or yeah. has it yeah okay uh so uh, as you saw then i do kind of debulk it do the gentle uh, hydro dissection because i did not want any adhesions with the posterior capsule so still and the size is very less no capsule very very right? small yeah, very so small yeah. so i was doing in uh, sculpting because i thought that maybe i will cause less damage rather than direct chop i did not even chop in the center if you see and uh, proceed with my fake but so i so don't you think that if you had used any pupillary expanded devices yes. it would have been your yes. life would have been very yes. much easier yes and that is what i generally do it yeah. but as i said this was the case which was just uh, you know uh, no. i mean like for that yeah. rexis i must have spent amazing amount of time uh, yes coming and going out and then i think in the end i was just like whatever it's happened let me go and now the again pupil is coming down yes yeah. it's absolutely mm-hmm. true i should have put the uh, pupil expander and then i start i remain in the center do uh, my fake emulsification pretty much in the back uh and the fake emulsification then i realized that it is too small and i may cause more damage so i go ahead stop in between and i cut little more of that capsule uh with the scissors and make the opening slightly bigger than what it was uh, before completing my full fake so uh now i have slightly better uh, uh opening than what when i started with my fake emulsification and uh i continue with the fake emulsification so i think it was uh, really true that i should have put it so here i uh, put the ctr uh, can you just pause it uh, sheetal so i think uh, this cataract was something which was very easy to you know uh, chop i guess had it been a grade 4 5 cataract harder cataract which needed more time and more t- uh, to be spent i think secondarily also you can put a iris hoax or a pupillary expanded device true so that you know everything becomes very easy because there is a small rexis so after putting that expanded device you can enlarge also yes. and then do your fake yes uh, yes i should have done it in fact uh, because you this required this just a central even, chopping even your zonules are weak because the lens was moving quite a bit yes. so yes. you could have put even 
uh, iris the capsule hook, hook and, and that would have pulled the iris also a little bit yes yeah. true uh, yes, and maybe uh, uh, yeah. because uh, in between I go yeah. and uh, the, make just, enlarge oh, yeah. it little more. But capsular mm-hmm. hooks at this stage because the rexus is not a proper capsular. Yeah, rexus, it's, it's a very small rexus. Yes, actually, it's too point. small. Also, and there were like you know the cuts were not really those uniform. So I I was no I was not knowing actually all these thoughts had come, but I I was not very sure whether I would cause more damage with all these Basically things. Basically, you were thinking you still you have made your rexus in the second plane with the scissor. With the scissor, yes. But you yes. actually had a true rexus on top. Yes, exactly true. Uh, yes. So I go ahead and put uh, CTR inside, and the lens uh, goes in pretty much uh, decently uh, well. So I did not have too much of trouble uh, putting lens. Hmm. So I uh, is that cortex at the back or no? I'll tell you that yeah. is actually posterior capsular opacification, which happens yeah. very commonly in vitrectomized eyes. Yes. So this was a combined case: silicone oil removal and cataract. So this is Dr. Manish now, which is inside uh, and cutting off the posterior capsule. Generally, we do the posterior capsular opening with most of our combined cases because the capsule is always uh, open. So uh, this is what my going get stuff was. Thank you so much. Beautifully managed. Yeah, okay. very nicely managed, Dr. Yeah. Shivil. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Please take the mic, sir. Sir, still the confusion remains whether which was the anterior capsule. The point is, while doing the surgery, also afterwards, also what she was cutting looked like a capsule, though the jury says that it was a subcapsular uh, fibrosis. So still, I think which was the capsule is still unclear for me. So Sheetal, what you felt? You see, surgeon can. Uh, at that point in time, I actually thought that it was cap fibrous capsule. Uh, but uh, I may need to actually go and see the full. Uh, this is still an edited video and review it, and what she said may uh, uh, be true. But uh, at that point in time, I actually thought that it was because whatever I had removed was a very very thin, papery thin thing. So I don't know whether that was capsule or not. I'm still not very sure about and it. If it was a subcapsular fibrosis, then I think it should be easily be removed by FACO and yes. it should not be required yes. cutting. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. Awesome. Is subcapsular fibrosis there or is it capsular fibrosis? Subcapsular. I always maybe. I always thought it is when you are doing the, it's always uh, at the capsular level there's a very nice video by dr deepak megur okay about this you should see but it that's for yeah. no, that is for fibrosis and sub calcified subcapsular plaque so there are two yeah. different things the calcified plaques are subcapsular hmm. the fibrosis is at the level of the capsule at that point uh, that is what i actually thought it was at the level of the capsule but yeah. i would certainly uh, revise yeah. and review this case yeah so it, i think it's still unexplored because yes. that is not the end and we are coming out and we are realizing new things which are happening thank you so much <laughs> yeah maybe you just found something new a new layer in the capsule Okay, so next we uh, move on to Dr. Rishi Swaroop, uh, who is a prolific cataract and refractive and corneal surgeon from Hyderabad, a very good friend. Thank Rishi. you, Harshul, for including me in this session. Um, so this is uh, not a very complicated case. Uh, this patient uh, basically had come to me after having a, a penetrating trauma in the eye and the corneal tear was done elsewhere. And the patient had come to me with a drop in vision. Uh, and when I saw him, the patient had a uh, torn capsule and a sutured corneal wound like that. Um, and um, there was cortex coming out. And it was an intumescent lens. And in the in, uh, inferior area of the tear, there was um, the lens matter was basically in contact with the cornea. So I wasn't sure if we had vitreous uh, in the wound also. So this is. Uh, what we did. Uh, so basically, uh, it was time to do a cataract surgery for this particular patient. Uh, so the dilemma was whether to just remove the cataract uh, uh, and put the lens secondarily after removing the sutures. But uh, since the uh, suturing had not been done very badly, I decided to go ahead and uh, put a lens primarily and avoid the patient ha- another surgery. So as you can see, when we put the air bubble, it's not going through in the inferior area. So I was a bit suspicious that 
we might have some vitreous going to the wound in that area. So um, it's stained with caps uh, with trepan glue, and uh, I'm trying to. There's an anterior capsular tear which was there. Uh, the configuration was not very clear, so I tried to kind of make a uh, nick on that tear and um, uh, try to make manipulate some um, kind of a rexus from it, but it was just not do happening, and it es essentially extended peripherally. So I decided that instead of causing more damage to the anterior capsule. At this stage, I will star start um, using a vitrector straight away and enlarge the capsule also with that only and then eat away whatever cortex or vitreous matter there may be in that area. Uh, possibly what I could have done was put um, a tricot primarily and then done it. But anyway, I wanted to just clear out that whole area and then uh, stain with tricot. Now, as I cleared the cortex, I see this flapping and this central emptiness which indicates that we have a uh, posterior capsular tear as well. Yes. Can we just pause it? Yeah. When was this uh, primary repair was done? How About uh, 10 days ago. 10, two weeks ago, I think. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay, then we can't take off the sutures first. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, of yeah, course, I would have liked to take yes, off sutures yeah, yeah. and then do it in a controlled way. But right. uh, this was a recently operated case, plus the cortex was getting into miscent, yeah. so it had to be taken out. Should I proceed? Yeah, yeah, please. So, as you can see, we are now doing the anterior vitrectomy. So, it's always good to first uh, go behind the posterior capsule, remove the uh, central part of the anterior vitreous first, and then whatever is anterior to that, then you can kind of clear, because then they'll not have a posterior attachment, um, um, using it in higher cutting and lower aspiration um, rate mode. So. Uh, now you can see there's a kind of a U-shaped tear in the anterior capsule which I'm seeing and I was not very sure of the uh, configuration of the posterior capsular tear. So once I was sure there's no vitreous. Uh, Rishi, can you pause it for a minute? Yes. So Sheetal, you are working with uh, Dr. Manish uh, uh, together. So are you allowed to do limbal anti-vitrectomy yeah, or only past plana vitrectomy? <laughs> no, actually... Uh because now like more allowed, and more uh, but I <laughs> I'm actually just framing it in a uh, I would yeah. like to give this credit to Dr. Vasavda uh, more than uh, Dr. Manish is uh, I prefer pass plana vitrectomy but I make only one port and my irrigation is through the side port but my uh, vitrector is through the pass plana route so my all vitrectomies are through pass plana anterior vitrectomies yeah so that's certainly a good idea but, but uh, uh, if I, I, want I don't like going behind the limbus so yeah, yeah I think that I uh, that yeah. confidence I got it uh, because of our retina colleagues. Right. For uh, for interior segment surgeons, most of us are not going through the past planner. What all would you say one should know, one should do before really starting with the... First of all, it's uh, if you can do these wonderful cataracts, it's very, very easy to go. It's just a mental block and there's nothing... Uh, uh, very uh, difficult about it. It's just that you have to know the direction how to put the scleral yes. cannula. You can take your retina uh, person's help, and we just have to make one. You can do the irrigation through you're your using side. Trocar you using a or you you must you must be I using a 23 trocar. gauge vitrector. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, so I many a times use 25 gauge. Have access to that. Yeah, many that times I use 25 gauge. Ah, 25 gauge. So yeah. if you have access to that, then it's very uh, yeah. different. I, I think yeah, that's yeah. kind of a luxury. If you don't have I access, have. then uh, you really should not probably make a 20 gauge 20 gauge is a yeah. little tough because, because then you have to suture it and all of those then problems then you have to suture yes. it but i would still say yeah. ki it's not a big problem suturing uh, that as well but uh, i but think but it's not uh, if considering you're not that anterior vitrectomy to the limbus is perfectly all right if, yeah exactly if you're not i don't think it's worth making a sclerotomy which needs suturing if you're not yeah. comfortable with yeah. it but if you're comfortable it definitely has advantages but if you're going through the limbal route i think it's a good idea to go towards the base yes. first cut your vitreous at the base so that's you're not exactly pulling what i uh, yes, try to you're demonstrate not pulling more of yeah. vitreous. so uh, dr gaurav is here i'd like to ask what are the principle one should follow while doing anterior vitrectomy what 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 are the pertinent points which one should take care so I think uh, when you identify, when you have a PC break and you know, I, I, either it's like really small and you can convert it into a small rexus, otherwise you know, you will need vitrectomy. So, you know, you can't kind of wish it away and it should be done timely, otherwise the PC breaks will enlarge, you know, unnecessarily if you try to do more maneuvers uh, at that time. So I like to go in early if I'm sure that I'm going to have to do in any case. And what about settings like what? 
so you know the settings will vary from machine to machine as well the suctions and cut rate obviously you want to be very high but you don't want high infusion i like to keep very slow infusions and also uh, even aspiration i don't like to keep i just keep enough that is necessary i may start with a, a you know a lower one but then you know keep increasing it as as i need it and uh, of course uh, transmural assisted uh, is always great especially for people who are not used to doing it regularly but even for people who are quite conversant with it it makes much easier because you can identify those fine strands which you won't uh, see otherwise so i think um, uh, as far as the cut rates you know most machines will have good cut rates yeah. now yeah. and um, only thing is sometimes you should also know how to use the you know c- cut first or the you know uh, this thing because first, sometimes yeah. you actually need to switch it and some machines allow it and then yeah. it becomes really nice yeah. so and also off late you know i have started using these soft tip um, uh probes with the retina people use yeah. it really works well and so if you have mm-hmm. a pc rent and you've done a vitrectomy and then you want to do some more uh, cortex removal which is really fine under the uh, like uh, rexis or in the back and you don't want to disturb anything else so it allows for passive uh, you know uh, this thing removal of uh, fine cortex and it's uh, a very good i mean that's just additional to right. what yeah, you even if you have a disposable eye tip that has a soft tip silicon cannula they are beautiful actually yes, yes. Yeah. they hardly disturb going uh, with the uh, sort of around have you shifted to posterior uh, this thing uh, vitrectomy or you still no i i use my own machines but sometimes yes when we are anticipating uh, more uh, interventions then we use the constellation as well and it works very well so sometimes i need the light source and other things and i'll switch to the constellation mm-hmm. and they but have you, these you go nice pass play no huh yeah, many sometimes yeah. yes as required yeah. i mean yeah. not always i mean there are talks now that we say that immediately you switch to pass play now don't even yeah. try from the anterior side i don't agree with that most things can be done without you know going into the pass play now route and many things require you to go from the pass plana when otherwise you know you'll end up with a mess so. i have one doubt for all the panelists see in the older machines you used to say cut rate has to be higher than the aspiration 500 rakho and this 200 rakho but now you have cut rate which goes up to 5000 yeah, so yeah. can we keep the aspiration much higher or you still stick around to about 200 or 150 no i think uh, that that correlation is lost now i think yeah absolutely uh, i think we should move ahead rishi yeah yes So now basically I'm doing a bimanual irrigation aspiration uh, yeah. with a control kind of an aspiration so that it doesn't fall into the vitreous. And now you can see the configuration of the posterior uh, tear which is a large V-shaped tear extending from one uh, edge to the other. Um so basically on on the right side you can see that both the anterior capsule and the posterior capsule are deficient. So at this point I'm planning how I am going to go ahead and put the lens and which lens so at this stage I put the triams in loan I could have probably done it before the cortical aspiration also but I was fairly sure that I didn't have it trace at that stage but now I can see this uh, kind of strand coming to the wound so I decided to go in with the cutter from the opposite side and just go underneath the limbus and ki- kind of cut that strand out now I put in the viscoelastic so Uh, probably it's a good idea if you can use a whisk coat in this case i'm just using an hpmc and uh, essentially um, the rest of the surgery is pretty simple uh, enlarge the wound a little bit and put uh, a three piece foldable lens in the sulcus um if i had a intact anterior capsule i would have captured it but in this case because the anterior capsule capsule is also torn we just decided to leave it in the sulcus i felt there was a little bit of vitreous again there so we just kind of cleared that uh, uh rishi can you just pause uh, yeah the only thing i think i would uh, differ or do little differently is because your uh, case was just two weeks post trauma the sutures hmm. are very uh, this thing you know the i wouldn't have planned uh, i will implantation at this stage because it's going to cause a lot of even though the suturing is good and all it's going to change uh, the astigmatism so i would have preferred S- doing this so shital what happens is even though your astigmatism is changing your spherical equivalent doesn't really change much so i saw the topography on this case preoperatively and the central cornea was fairly okay okay that's why i decided to go ahead okay. because you know you have to otherwise take the patient up for another surgery if that's avoidable uh it's not like the lens is going to cause uh, an inflammation or additional yeah, something like no, that. that so the, i took a call uh that um and i explained to the patient that we may not get a spot on but he preferred the one surgery approach yeah anyways i think uh, even yeah. if uh, like later on also not that you can put toric iol in this so exactly <laughs> so and we can always correct the rest with the laser with you know with the laser yeah. 
I'll, should I continue? Yeah, so uh, rest is quite simple. I just put in pilocarpine and luckily we got a nice round pupil. Um, couple of sutures needed to be changed, so I did that after this, which I'm not going to show. So that's essentially the end of surgery. Thank you very much, Rishi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. Sir. Take the mic, please. Sir, you have done a wonderful job, but uh, post-op, with a corneal scar, the vision doesn't improve. How do you tackle? I'm sorry, sir. It you have done a wonderful yes. job, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everything is fine. Macula is okay. Yeah. You know, this is a traumatic cataract, no glaucoma, nothing. Yeah. But because of this corneal scar, hmm. the vision doesn't improve. And what will you do? So this kind of a scar is not in the visual axis. So if the vision is not improving because of the scar, it's because of an irregular astigmatism induced by the scar. Yeah. So you have to look at the topography and after three months or so, once the edema, everything is settled down, I would do a topography guided laser to regularize the shape what of the cornea. What in this case? In this particular case, uh, thankfully I didn't need to do much. Uh, after removing the sutures, his vision was pretty good. So also, I would just yeah. uh, like to address your question, sir, is uh, if you cannot do a uh, laser correction also, and if there is an irregular astigmatism, you can always give them the rigid contact lenses, rose sure. lenses, right. or mini Absolutely. scleral lenses, also tried, and that think. would, uh, yeah. because the, yes. the about laser vision correction, the, the Sometimes corneal scar, the previous surgeon had not done that very leveled. Uh, sure. Yes, it could yeah, be so difficult. Yeah, so then, so then uh, a laser really shows. helps. What? What it may do is, even if it doesn't remove the large magnitude of the error, it removes the irregular astigmatism it. in the visual axis. So that will give a reasonably good spectacle corrected vision. The child, you know, when they still developed uh, amblyopia yes. and all the sorts of issues. Dr. Harshul uh, is again probably one of the most prolific surgeons I've seen. Very good hand. He's actually excellent at everything he does. I'm sure we have seen him at the LBO Dhamal. He sings, he dances, he uh, does all kinds of things. He's excellent at many, many sports including uh, cricket, badminton, table tennis. Thanks. And let's see how he plays badminton uh, in the eye. Okay. <laughs> Can I have my feed from my laptop, please? Okay. So, uh, thank you so much, Rishi, for those kind words. So, I'll be sharing one or two videos with you. So, this is the first uh, video. This this was a traumatic subluxation. You can see that the subluxation is more than four or five clock hours here. And uh, this was a white cataract with fibrotic anterior capsule. So, what is uh, Rohit, sir? Dr. Rohit, what is your plan of action in... Uh, uh, case like this, looking I at this. I think what I would do is I would use uh, uh, micro scissors from multiple points after creating uh, the, uh, the initial nick, so that uh, because with this fibrosis, if you are going to do, uh, it's going to create more stress to the zonules. So, and I once I'm done with it, if I'm able to create a circular axis. I'll go in with the capsular hooks because I think it is subluxated uh, hmm. around 180 degrees. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Vanashi, any other thoughts? Yeah. Okay. So I, I would probably even consider a, a vitrector if uh, yeah. the micro scissors yeah. is not helping. Right. Okay. So, <coughs> with all these thoughts in mind, I initiate the capsular axis. So, I just give a nick there and once I'm able to create a small opening, I go ahead and as Dr. Roy said, you need to use these micro instruments to, uh, from different side ports, you know, to reach to the proper area where you want to go. So here, again, rexis forceps is very important because you need to put some kind of forces there. So cystitome can't do that work. So here you see, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, enlarge the make the capsular axis and once I'm able to reach to this area which has got uh, obvious fibrosis here as you can make out so in the area of the fibrosis if you try to pull it will radialize and it will go in the periphery towards the equator so once you reach the so it all depends on the if, if you want an axis of five millimeter size and the fibrotic area is totally entirely covering it you need to cut with scissors 
and if 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 that is in the very central area 3 mm you have the clear area of course you can make the capsular excess so here i'm holding the flap from the right hand and going with my i'm holding with left hand now and going with the right hand to cut it so once i reach this area again i shift my hand from this port to another port and cutting here so now here once i reach in the area of the subluxation you should be careful that you have two 2.5 mm of the capsular excess margin there because we need to use capsular hooks and to put the capsular hook you should have good rim of the anterior capsular excess there otherwise they will slip off from there Uh, Harshul, yes. I think at this stage even a, a vitrector would have done a brilliant job actually. Um, of course, micro scissors will do the job, but every time you're using the micro scissor, you may yes. um, uh, not continue the same plane sometimes. Yeah. So uh, yes, in my, you in can hands, do with yeah, vitrector, of especially course. in the area of the fibrosed part. Right, right. So I go ahead, and once I finish from all the sides now I have a good capsular axis there you can see and another the, whenever we cut through these fibrotic area the advantage is that these these axis margin they are al always very strong so now I go ahead and put uh, trying to give the anterior posterior support with the capsular hooks so you need to put capsular hooks there go ahead and put three capsular hooks so once you have these capsular hooks you can go ahead and do phaco emulsification this was a uh, white but brittle cataract so it easily comes off and once it comes out i i realize that it, it doesn't have any role now so i take these capsular hooks off and now at this stage you need to give equatorial support to the capsular bag so put some OVD take them off and uh, I put a culeus hook from the side port as Dr. Sheetal also mentioned to just bend it and once you have the CTR in the capsular bag you can see that this entire capsular bag gets stretched out so we have the equatorial support now and now I go ahead and do irrigation aspiration there so meticulously I am cleaning the so before changing instruments always go ahead and put OVD so that you don't collapse the anterior chamber before changing your hands now I'm putting irrigation cannula from one side port. So after this, I decide because the subluxation is more than four clock hours, we always need to anchor it with the sclera with either uh, capsular tension segment or you. I would have used the Sioni CTR. So what is your preferred uh, like? Is device uh, nowadays CT segment is actually a lot easier because you know trying yeah. to dial that whole thing with the suture sometimes is entanglement Entangle, yeah. it, it creates a mess so this is this is actually a much better option in my hands and in fact I've stopped using suture also now I just use the 50 proline and ah. I kind of create that little right. uh, right. thing like Yamane yes so it works very well okay. so you don't need to put it with the suture in yes you can thread it later yes yes so uh, this CTS segment has an eyelet there which needs to be come over the entire capsule so so what what suture are you using nowadays this was a case uh, like it was almost two three years back are you started using Gore-Tex suture for no. or still using I'm 9 still zero? using proline 9 zero. Yeah. yeah but many surgeons have shifted using Gore-Tex suture but availability is a very big issue for Gore-Tex sutures I think it is available in India now yeah, it's and available. You have, yeah, you have to take it from those uh, cardiac surgeons. surgeons. Yeah. Cardiothoracic surgeons. Cardiothoracic surgeons. Right. So, uh, 
So you just tie the knot here in the eyelet. It's a double arm proline suture and so the advantage is that it's a lot easier to put in the capsular bag. So I go ahead and put this segment in capsule back there and the this eyelet has to be over the anterior capsule and after that you go behind the limbus and railroad with a 26 gauge needle so both these arms are taken out and you tie the knot there which Harshul, can I just pause you yeah, here? Yeah. Yeah, See, at this stage, you need to put the, when you're doing the railroading, your needle has to come in, right? Yes. So, you have to come anterior to the capsule yes. without rupturing the anterior capsule. How yes. do you make sure you do that, that you don't damage so, the capsule with your needle? Yeah, so it's, we are always, uh, you know, doing it under direct visualization and trying to keep the needle be well up. I know, but the yeah. entry point. Entry point. Yes. Yeah. Your entry point could go through this, uh, the equator of the bag sometimes, right? Yeah. How do you make sure you enter at the correct plane? So what I try to do is I go almost two millimeter behind the limbers and when I'm as soon as I see the tip of the needle, I just keep it up. So that is always coming up. Absolutely. Is, do you have any other is there any point in mind? Do, yeah, Dr. Rishi. No, no, I'm just asking how, okay. what, what do you use to make sure because I've had uh, uh, one instance in okay. which I ended up going I, I found that my needle was inside the capsular bag and then so, uh, you basically damaged the integrity of the bag I'll just show you see then as soon as I come here I see that it's coming over the capsular bag here you know the tip of the needle you mm -hmm. redirect it yeah yeah so it's we directly seeing it yeah so once you railroad these two, would, uh, uh, would yeah. putting uh, would, would putting uh, some kind of uh, uh, you know uh, cohesive visco at that particular point on the anterior capsule also would help just to create a space for the needle to yes, come. Yes, 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 it does. Yeah. Harshul, have you made a groove there or? Y yes, yes, that's a groove which okay. I made. Yeah. So, so the knots always need to be buried. Yeah. So uh, you see here. So once I tie the knots, I see that now capsular bag is well centered and uh, it's perfectly stabilized so you need equatorial support as well as anteroposterior support for long term centration and uh, after that I just I decide to go ahead and put a single piece IOL take off all the OVD and uh, hydro stitch all the incisions and that finishes the case beautifully managed thank you so when i'm using sutures i like to use a hoffman pocket yeah because yeah. you can yes. avoid the kind yes. of yes yes cotton and this incision way. and all that stuff true true yeah any questions from the audience Next okay so there is one short video I will just show and after that I will invite Dr. Vardhaman. Can I have feed free from my laptop? Okay, so this is the case uh, which was a intumescent heart cataract. What I just want to show here is uh, the double rexes which are used. So whenever you have intumescent cataract like this, it's always good to make a very small rexis in the center. And once I make this small rexis, I go ahead and debulk the capsular bag with 27 gauge cannula. You can see the entire this liquefied cortical matter is coming out in this cannula. I go ahead from side port also. So once we have debulked, it's a lot easier to create a perfect capsular access. So what what I want to show here is uh, you never should be complacent at any stage. Look here, the entire thing is done. The You think the hardest part is over. Go ahead, I'm doing bimanual irrigation aspiration here. Changing hands. And uh, 
Once I'm reaching here, you see what's happening. So it can happen sometimes, but you should be very careful that you don't further, you know, take the entire bag out. Now I should I'll pause you here and yes. I'll ask um, um, any of the panelists at this stage what should be done uh, step by step can somebody Dr. Vanashree. tell us yes Dr. Yeah. Vanashree I think day. at this point reflux is the first thing let go of that capsule do not take out your irrigation probe because we have to maintain the anterior uh, the pressure in the uh, anterior chamber with the other hand push in the viscoelastic I think, yeah, I think that's a very good yeah. point that without removing the irrigation first you have to put in a dispersive OVD. Yes. Dispersive if you have, if you don't have any, go ahead and put what any yeah, OVD, any whatever, OVD is yeah. whatever is available. Yeah. You know. uh, but how does it matter whether it is dispersive cohesive? Dispersive will keep the vitreous back. That's of course. No, uh, that is when you have a PCR. This is an intact back and there's just a zonular dialysis. Rather I would prefer cohesive so that back will have a better pressure than dispersive. Uh, dispersive is going to uh, kind of you know plaque your PCR but in this case we are not worried about that so yeah. uh, I would like Dr. Rohit's uh, take on this uh, sorry I was just listening to the uh, no, so, uh, so just the pulled on these zonules you know the yeah. question is at this stage is it better to use a cohesive or a dispersive He's got you a have to, the first thing is you have to inflate the back mic yeah. please sir can you mic. turn on the mic 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 yeah, yeah. sorry so you, you have to inflate the bag somehow to inflate the bag, uh, I'm I'm not using by by manual. Uh, what uh, that is the yeah irrigation. If yeah, th that's another question because the chamber should not collapse by any means. Yeah. Can you just reflux it and uh, go with the irrigation off? Go close and dislodge it somehow. No, he has already dislodged it. Now uh, he has to remove his aspiration port. And then what we were discussing is whether to inflate so the this bag. So what happened? Prefer Dispersive okay. or cohesive? See, this is what happened, Rohit, sir. Oh, by God. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you were able to release it? Yes. The moment you were able to release it, you uh, li move forward slightly. Yeah. Now, at this point of time, the bag has not to collapse. So, the visco has to go in somehow so that the bag gets inflated and the, you know, the, that, that area goes back. Uh, you can, uh, you know, take out the aspiration port and uh, with the put the visco somehow inside, and uh, you know that should be. Yeah. So I think so whether cohesive yeah. or dispersive, it doesn't matter doesn't because you have to inflate yeah, the bag, whatever true. you put in. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Here it won't matter so much because we just have to. Yeah. Because there is no uh, vitreous disturbance here. Yeah. Here only so the th there is a hydrogenic zonular dialysis which has happened, and let's see so the important message is that never pull out all your instrument once you have a situation like this yeah that is the main thing yes so whenever we touch a hot off. oven we just take off all our hands so whenever you have a situation like it, don't take off all the instrument then try to put thing is keep calm at this stage i'm trying to just push it there because whatever has happened is a traumatic it's a hydrogenic dialysis it's not a progressive thing or anything you know it's what has happened so now I'm just going ahead, keeping my irrigation there, and whatever visco is there at the on the table, Use it first. I'm just using it first. Yes. So I'm going going ahead, putting visco, and now turning off irrigation and coming out, so that that area is now settled. Now again, I'm going from the main port and this. Yeah. And now what is what should be the approach next? So I think the next, since you have about uh, four clock hours or five clock hours, three, four clock hours, yeah, yeah. um, you can go ahead and put the um, CTR from any side like Dr. Rohit said. Yeah. But I would yeah. still try to go from the left side. Yeah, yeah. I always listen to my good friends. So <laughs> I go ahead and put a CTR there. See, this maneuver is important that you from one of the instruments you try to just guide it. bend the, yeah, guide it. Yeah. And then the distal part you kind of control it. Oh, sorry. So once you have this, 
now everything seems good here. It's almost circular, the capture record. Yes, yeah. So you decided to take the cortex after putting the lens, is it? Yes. Okay. So now the size of the axis was a little less. So first I decide to enlarge the capsular axis. Now there are two, uh, first CTR is of course the taking care of that area and more of haptic also I try to put in that area even though it's a hydrophilic lens but still so we take off all the cortical matter clean it nicely hydro stitch all the incisions yeah Yes, these are the modified hydro stitch cannulas. Where can one get these? They look very nice. Yeah, so I modified these cannula to hydro stitch the incisions and uh, Ovation is manufacturing them. Who? Ovation. Okay. Ovation International is manufacturing them. There is a one millimeter band at the mm, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, especially whenever you have, uh, we all do under topical anesthesia, patient tend to roll eyes up. We don't get uh, good access to hydro stitch all the incision so it's very helpful you just need to rotate your hands and thank you Arshul excellent okay. videos thank you so much so next uh, I'd like to invite another good friend Dr. Vardhman Kakaria a prolific cataract and refractive surgeon from Pune mm -hmm. I think uh, he has a credit of being the youngest surgeon to have a smile and doing maximum amount of smile at his center a pioneer in the work of refractive surgery. Dr. Vardhman. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harshul, for the kind invite. And it's always a pleasure to be part of this uh, symposium because I think there are a lot of take home pearls and a very unique case scenarios that we all discuss. So, just changing gears, I'm going to discuss something in refractive, a uh, unique case that we have seen and how we managed it. Uh, we all, all are quite aware that post LASIK epithelial growth is quite well published. It is a well known entity and has been published in hundreds of research papers. Uh, however, epithelial ingrowth overall has been seen to be much lesser in smile procedure, especially because your, your incision is very small, it's just 2 millimeters. And there are uh, basically only three reported cases until now, uh, uh, three series, I can say, which are reported right now. But however, out of them, two of them have actually shown that in majority of them, it is very, very small, innocuous and non-progressive. So there is one series by Sukhendra et al. and the other one by Everson et al who has shown that uh, it was seen in 10 out of 1500 cases that they had done and it was uh, very very minute and it spontaneously res uh, had a resolution in majority of them. There are only two cases which are reported to have progressive epithelial in growth after SMILE and one of them is from India and they had seen that there was a progressive epithelial in growth from the uh, small incision and there was a conduct which was seen and they went through the small incision, they debrided it once and after that there was a recurrence and because there was a recurrence they had ex ex enlarged the incision and they debrided it again and then they put the sutures in and still there was a recurrence and then the third time uh, they actually used a sealant glue to close the incisions and that is when it settled down and there is one other case which is published also from France. So this was another case that we had seen it's a 35 year old female patient who had uh, been referred by uh, one of our uh, colleagues and um, this was a patient who was done for moderate myopia minus 3.50 diopters and the left eye was doing pretty well uh, when she came to us which was three months after her primary procedure and her vision in the right eye was 6 by 36 and she had shown this kind of huge mixed astigmatism the vision had dropped and the quality of and the quantity of vision had dropped significantly you can see that this epithelial growth is bang in the visual axis and this was further seen on OCT. You can see that this is an isolated epithelial ingrowth, about 120 micron in thickness. But the good thing or important thing here to notice was that there was no uh, conduct towards the incision and it was an isolated epithelial ingrowth in the visual axis, which had also amounted to a lot of topographic irregular astigmatism and that has re resulted in a lot of poor visual acuity. So uh, of course, can I just pause you, Vajman? Uh, yes. I would just like to know, uh, without any entry or like you know, I cannot see anything. So how would this happen in general? What would be the mechanism for? What would be the mechanism, right? So basically, uh, in terms, 
now if for such cases the mechanisms are different so there are two mechanisms which are possible one of them is a typical post operative epithelial in growth in which you have a epithelial conduct from the incision itself so the incision is not sealed pretty well and that's when the surrounding epithelium if it is especially damaged during the entry is and going to actually grow through the incision right. and that is when you will actually see a complete conduct of the epithelium up to the incision so this is going to have a through and through epithelial in growth which will go to the uh, the visual axis that we commonly see yeah that is what we commonly see in post lasic uh, right. epithelial in growth in this case this was more of a implantation kind of epithelial in growth in which the if the surrounding um, epithelium of the incision is loose there is a chance that while dissecting right. the lenticule the epithelium has actually slid has in it is impossible inside. for it to know and that's when you have a isolated epithelium in growth right. and actually this is a very good question because that also decides how are you going to approach this case because that completely differs in the scenario uh, so vardhman just yeah. a minute what are the right. factors which increases the chances of epithelial in growth right. in a in a routine lasik case so if what a, one should be careful of yeah right so if there is a routine lasik case when i would expect more epithelial in growth if for example there is a missed uh, case in which there is epithelial basement dystrophy and this is one of the prime and i th- very bad uh, i think these are very highly recurrent uh, epithelial in growth very difficult to treat otherwise uh, i think cert- certain times you can say it if there is a lot of paracin used before the lasik procedure because paracin is going to kind yes, of right. loosen the epithelium and that is when if you are actually using especially microkeratome to create a flap that is when you can actually slough off a bit of epithelium can cause epithelial growth and of course if while you are repositing the flap you have actually damaged surrounding epithelium or you have not done good job in actually forming a nice amount of opposition that is the other reason where you can have it but having epithelial defect surrounding the flap is also another reason where you can have it and does reusing the blade in multiple cases yeah it can be one of the reason especially if the cut quality is not very good this is why it is seen that in femtolasic the epithelial growth chances are lesser because of the flap uh, opposition is much better fit because your fitting is much better so that's why so i think when we are using reusing the uh, blades it is going to increase the chances virtual yeah. another reason is yeah. if you have um, any bleed suppose you have vascularized cornea and yeah. the flap yes, edge yes, is yes, having yes. some heme that lifts the edge of the flap and through that True. epithelium can grow in absolutely and so basically you have to make sure there's nothing between the flap edge and the bed absolutely so uh, what do you do when you have you are cutting the flap with keratome and you have a bleed if it is a vascularized cornea right so yeah. basically if uh, and if it's some um, some stains remain there even at the end of repositing the flap right so first thing is of course we have to be careful to first know if it is a long term contact lens users they are the ones who are more having propensity of having peripheral bleeds one thing that i do for the such patients actually i use a alpha gan p yeah. drops before i do the microkeratome lasik on them or even a femtosecond lasik on them Because there's only I, one problem right. with that the pupil comes down and then actually it yeah. takes it takes some time for it to act on the pupil but yeah. if it is for example that's why we give it on people who are having uh, night time uh, optical so phenomenon post lasik yeah. procedure when do you put that drop like so just just, after? just about no just about 5 minutes beforehand that okay. is good enough it is very quick acting 5 to 10 minutes beforehand is quite quick acting you will see that eyes become completely white yeah one thing which is seen in this scenario uh, this was like a very old study which has shown that your chance of flap displacement is slightly higher if you are actually using the alpha gan p so you have to be slightly more careful and use it very judiciously so i'm using so congest decongestant drop which you have you, you know, can use that yeah, also that so uh, alpha gan p works yeah, well okay. in uh, right, yeah yeah right, so right. So in this case uh, of course uh, I think uh, when we have seen it is a very unique uh, nature of epithelial in growth because it is isolated in the center and we do not have the epithelial conduct so there are two things which were already published one of them was that you can go through the small incision which was already published two times in the past uh, where you can go through the incision you can try to debride it but as you can see very clearly if you are going to the center it is not very it's not going to be very easy to yeah. approach through the small incision and you may not be able to remove it completely exactly. neither use the mitomycin c or yeah. alcohol second thing is to use a yag laser which uh, is a good tool for peripheral very minute epithelial in growths and i i'm sure you rishi has also used it in the past yeah. but in the center you should not do it because it can cause scarring in the visual axis so this was when what so, we realized is that we just need a access to the epithelial in growth so that we can debride it Yes. and this is a novel tool which is used in uh, uh, in with visumax it's called as a circle software 
so what the circle software does is that it uses a very typical donut type of extra femtosecond laser application and converts your smile cap into a flap so when it opens up like a flap you have a full access to the epithelial ingrowth to debride of course this was never used in the past for this particular reason and this was used mainly as an enhancement uh, entity so whenever you have a under correction after smile or regression that is when such entity was used to lift up the flap do examer laser application and put it back so this was like a off label first time use so i'm just going to show it as you can see this is the donut shaped uh, application that you can see and this is the epithelial growth which is there in the center sorry yeah so this is the donut shape application and there are going to be certain extra amount of pulses which are going to be fired in the periphery so this is going to convert this smile cap into a flap so i am going through a new side cut but understand that i am going through the same interface which was created before during smile procedure so i am going beyond the epithelial ingrowth now and i am going uh, i am not so basically i am just trying to make sure that i am not opening up the full flap i am just exposing the flap good enough for my epithelial ingrowth debridement so now in this case it is crucial is it so accurate that you can do it uh, no sir because i can visualize it okay. in this case okay. i can visualize it in this case and it was isolated so in this case it was possible but not always so for example if you have more extensive one you will have to open up the full flap yeah you can open up the where it was previously done correct it's very accurate sir absolutely super accurate yes yes very accurate circle is very accurate very accurate it goes exactly in the same interface yeah so basically now i'm debriding the epithelial ingrowth and it is important that you also debride from the under surface of the newly formed flap as well so this is what i'm doing now i'm removing it also from the under surface of the flap and then i'm i used a bit of mitomycin c then irrigated the interface and put the flap back you don't have to put any sutures or anything especially because there is no epithelial conduct so a, a bcl was put in and there is this slit lamp attachment to the uh, can i just pause once uh, yes. after mitomycin c you washed it no washed it yes yeah, yeah. okay so after mitomycin c you yeah. have to give a very good wash yeah and i, I just wanted you to say it because yeah. people might take that message that you leave mitomycin c yeah. true 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 and i think what, it is what what concentration do you use yes. so we use 0.02% similar to what we would for use in a prk patient so this is just for few seconds like 5 to 6 seconds it's you don't need like a gradation uh, manner of mitomycin c like we what we use in prk right so that is good enough yeah so basically after this you can see that the the irregular astigmatism uh, improved vastly and the patient's vision improved from 636 to 6 by 9 vision with a small amount of astigmatism so this is what we have published uh, recently in uh, therapeutic section of the journal of refractive surgery and this became the first report of use of circle for this particular entity so just wanted to voice out with a unique case scenario in this case thank you beautifully managed and i would have done exactly the same thing because it is so central if you try to pull it from the smile incision you will leave some epithelial cells for absolutely. sure absolutely. and they will again proliferate absolutely so very well there managed. is also a chance of creating a new epithelial fistula exactly so it can which, go into the recurrence yeah, course which was not connect, uh, connected to the wound now will be connected to the wound absolutely, absolutely. well managed yes Good job. thank you uh thank you very much uh, dr vardhman any questions from the audience or okay so i like yes sir please sir yeah for uh, mask uh, taking away the blood vessels uh, pediatric surgeons use brimonidine is that also a good option alpha so alpha yeah, yeah. alpha gan exactly same thing, thing yeah same thing yeah 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 yes. so either you can use as dr vardhman said alpha gan p or mezol or nefagul these kind of decongestant drop also we can use right yeah okay thank you so i think with this we come to end of uh, this session uh, when the going gets tough the tough get going thank you all the speakers dr rohit om prakash dr vardhman dr vanashi dr sheetal dr rishi and thanks to all the toughest guys who were there till the end of this session and girls thank you so much <laughs> thank you good job yeah. thanks nice. thanks a lot so let's have a photograph here